Welcome to the church. Um, my name is Sarah Cochran, um, and along with Eric Fischel, uh, we co-curated the exhibition, which is upstairs. Um, thank you. It is my enormous pleasure to introduce um, our two principal uh, speakers today, who will be introducing uh, the uh, individuals uh, they will be working with this afternoon. Um, and um, I would like to formally introduce them. So Sarah Cohen, who knows no, in no introduction to this group, obviously is the one who launched and founded and is the administrator of the Center for Parkinson's Disease. Yay! 2019, um, she received the Degenerative D Disease Special Interest Group Service Award in obviously um, honor of the remarkable work that you do. Um, it, it is a huge, huge honor to have you here. Um, other awards are the 2022 Empowering Communities to Deliver Sustainable Evidence-Based Fall Prevention Program, and that is obviously something that um, the boxing helps with. So it is with just enormous thanks um, to you for being here and also sharing all of your expertise. Um, so welcome, Sarah, and thank you. Your partner in crime is Michelle. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Michelle needs no introduction. Obviously, uh, the owner, head coach, and instructor of the epic martial arts here in Sag Harbor, home of the rock steady boxing Sag Harbor. She is a former national and international sport karate fighting championship, a 35-year veteran of teaching the fighting arts, and in January of 2023, this year, she was formally inducted into the Women's Martial Arts Hall of Fame. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Since 2017, she has worked with over 200 Parkinson's fighters who have come through the Rocksteady boxing program. And you have said that this has been one of the highlights of your career. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing everybody here today. And we are so excited about your program. Thank you. Wow, I'm only a little bit nervous. <laughs> it is so wonderful to see everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for the beautiful introduction. It is wonderful to be here. I had the great privilege of sitting next to Eric Fischel and April Gornick one evening over a year ago at the fabulous Artist and Writers Evening at Almond Restaurant. Eric mentioned to me that the church's summer 2023 exhibit would be dedicated to boxing, to which I, of course, responded. Count is in. We're there. <laughs> I'm not sure it's what Eric had in mind initially, but I am so grateful to both of them and everyone at the church for hosting us today. Before we get... Yes, thank you. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the incongruence of Parkinson's and boxing. On first glance, they don't seem to go together, at least not in any positive way. However, by the end of the presentation today, I hope to share with all of you an understanding of why boxing matters and an appreciation of how boxing has changed this community. Michelle Del Giorno and I started Rocksteady Boxing and we have grown the program together. As our boxers know, we complement one another. She tells me what to do and I do it. <laughs> Today's presentation is much the same. I will start with a brief overview of Parkinson's disease and why we should care. I'll review how I came to this work and why exercise is important to people living with Parkinson's disease. And then I will hand it over to Michelle who will run the heart of the program. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder only after Alzheimer's disease. It is characterized by depletion of a neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine and results in the cardinal motor symptoms of tremor, 
slowness of movement, stiffness, and changes in posture and balance. Many individuals living with Parkinson's disease report a more complex web of multi-system symptoms, often presenting many years before a formal diagnosis. To date, there is no cure. There are over one million people living with Parkinson's disease in the United States. 90,000 people this year will be diagnosed with the disease, a number that is 50% higher than previously believed. Reports suggest that the prevalence of Parkinson's disease has doubled in the past 20 years and will double again in the next 20. Parkinson's is the fastest growing brain disease worldwide. And I've heard it said that if Parkinson's disease were an infectious disease, we would be talking about the global Parkinson's pandemic. Why this increase in disease prevalence? When I first started working in the field of Parkinson's, we talked primarily about idiopathic Parkinson's. Idiopathic meaning we don't know the cause. Only about 15% of diagnoses are due to genetic causes, leaving a large number of unknown etiologies. But this understanding is changing. Researchers and doctors Ray Dorsey, Michael Kuhn, and Boss Bloom published a book in 2020 entitled Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription for Action. Parkinson's disease, they claim, is largely preventable. Preventable because the increased prevalence of the disease is very likely linked to chemical and toxin contamination in our environment. Although air quality has improved in the United States, over 40% of Americans are regularly exposed to poor air quality, a known risk factor for developing the disease. Paraquat, a herbicide banned in 32 countries, including China and the European Union, but used with increasing frequency here in the United States, is linked to Parkinson's. Interestingly, Paraquat, along with another pesticide, rotenone, is used in Parkinson's research to induce and study the onset of Parkinson's symptoms. And yet the EPA just reapproved Paraquat for use in our country in October 2020, providing a license for use for an additional 15 years. Trichloroethylene is a ubiquitous chemical. It is primarily used as a degreasing agent, and early studies suggest that exposure to the chemical increases the risk of developing Parkinson's disease by 500%. It is found in over half of the most toxic Superfund sites across the country and contaminates 30% of our groundwater here in the United States, including a four-mile-long, two-mile-wide plume right here on Long Island. In a recent presentation given by Dr. Ray Dorsey, he stated that only two cents of every Parkinson's research dollar is perhaps understandably spent on prevention. Preventing and eradicating Parkinson's, he claims, is possible, but it will require a widespread grassroots public health and advocacy movement. I did not initially come to Parkinson's research and care from a personal experience or connection. I grew up in rural, small town Indiana, always keenly aware that I was different from my peers. The only immigrant, the only child not enrolled in Sunday school, the only kid on the soccer team whose father's father wore knee-high socks under his Birkenstocks, <laughs> year-round, regardless of the weather. Needless to say, I'm probably not a surprise to anyone in this room, I grew up shrouded in social anxieties and awkwardness. I found my voice in college written in the pages of books, research articles, and numbers. As my career as a physical therapist developed, my penchant for data and research helped me to create a clinical niche working with people living with Parkinson's disease. And as I did so, I noticed a trend. Many of my patients improved substantially, nearing age-adjusted norms in many of the validated outcome measures I used in the clinic. Considering the progressive nature of the disease, this to me was astounding. In 2017, I submitted a research poster pro proposal to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Edinburgh, Scotland, presenting evidence from just one case study, following one patient through time, from intake and physical therapy to discharge to presentation in a community-based wellness program, not Parkinson's specific, and again at one year follow-up. The results of this patient's progress were impressive, reaching normal scores on all of the outcome measures and maintaining that progress at one year. What did this suggest? That exercise and physical therapy improve how patients move, and by extension, their function and independence. And it was very much from this experience that I renewed my commitment to create a community-based exercise program for the Parkinson's, pro Parkinson's community here on the east end of Long Island. And so I turned to the research. Why was I seeing such improvements in my patients? 
Could my small anecdotal findings be broadened to benefit a range of people living with the disease? And I found that I was not the only one asking this question. In 1980, there were no clinical trials looking at exercise and Parkinson's disease. By 2005, there were 20. By 2010, the number of randomized controlled trials looking at some type of exercise modality and its effects on people with Parkinson's disease had almost doubled. As I was updating this presentation, I lost track of counting at 100 articles published in 2022 alone. And here is what I found. People with Parkinson's disease are 29% less active than their peers, which is worse than it sounds because their peers aren't very active either. <laughs> People with Parkinson's are two times more likely to fall and have a nine-fold increase in repeated falls. The economic cost of Parkinson's disease in the United States in 2017 was $51 billion, half of which reflects indirect medical costs such as loss of work, early retirement, and care partner support. That's the bad news, but I also found a lot of good news. People in middle age who exercise are less likely to develop Parkinson's disease in the first place, and if you increase the intensity of that exercise, the protection is more substantial. Not only that, but animal model studies suggest exercise might delay the progression of the disease, and what we definitively know, based on the numerous human clinical trials, is that people who Parkinson's, with Parkinson's disease who exercise do better than those who don't. Exercise has the potential to delay the disability of the disease. With such compelling evidence, why are we so inactive? On the simplest level, there aren't appropriate programs for, pe for people to access. There might be issues with transportation. The overwhelming cost of health care makes the additional expense of gym memberships and fitness classes insurmountable. And then there is the very real challenge of self-efficacy, believing you can do it. And so I set out to create a community-based wellness program providing fitness and cultural programming to people living with Parkinson's disease on the east end of Long Island, designed carefully to mitigate the known barriers to exercise. With unwavering support from hospital administration at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, the Center for Parkinson's Disease launched September 2017 with two programs, the Paint at the Parish program at the Parish Arts Museum and Rocksteady Boxing at Epic Martial Arts in Sag Harbor. In March 2020, before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had eight community-based programs in six communities across the East End. As our numbers grew, so did the sense of camaraderie, the strength of community, and from that, a shared goal and vision. We were no longer singers, boxers, or yogis. We became one community with one goal, fighting the progression of the disease. And so when our doors closed in March 2020 due to COVID-19, it was a previously unimaginable moment marked with uncertainty. With support from the hospital, my collaborating partners, coaches, the Center for PD reopened online, launching an array of virtual classes, including boxing, singing, cooking, qigong, chair yoga, and support group meetings. Our journey back to in-person programming was slow and not without setbacks. The very real benefit of connecting and exercising in person cannot be underestimated. Yet, the precedent of virtual programming will continue to benefit our community moving forward. Sing Loud for PD started in person, developed in collaboration with the fabulous Anthony Madonna at Guildhall. The program now meets weekly via Zoom and over 100 singers join us from 42 states and eight countries. Many of our singers joined virtually from underserved communities without previous access to Parkinson-specific programs. Eat Well with PD is grounded in our local community, sourcing local food from East End farms and integrating nutritional education and cooking instruction. We continue to meet virtually. My partners at the East End Food Institute hand deliver meal kit boxes, including food, menus, and recipes, so that we may come together for nutritional lecture and shared meal experience on Zoom. Paint at the Parish is our flagship program and has been fully subscribed since we started in 2017. Under the leadership of Martha Stotsky and Wendy Gottlieb, the program includes a gallery tour and hands-on multimedia projects in the studio. With support from Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, private donors, and institutional partners, all of these programs are offered at no charge to the participants. Rock Steady Boxing, the reason we're here, is a national boxing-inspired exercise program designed specifically for people with Parkinson's. It remains our largest and most popular program. 
Rocksteady started in Indianapolis, Indiana, coincidentally very close to my hometown, in 2006, and I first learned about the program from one of our Broxers here with us today. There are now 871 affiliate programs worldwide, of which the Center for Parkinson's Disease supports two, one at the hospital's wellness facility in Hampton Bays and one at Epic Martial Arts here in Sag Harbor. I'm frequently asked, I know exercise is important, but what kind of exercise should I do? And my answer is usually the same. Find something you can do safely and commit to doing every single day. You would never wake up and not take your medication. You should never wake up and not do some form of physical activity. And yet, if I'm honest, this answer can be nuanced. Early research suggests that high-intensity exercise may more effectively delay the progression of the disease, or at least the movement symptoms, and that the high-intensity physical and cognitive challenge of boxing might have unique benefits for people living with Parkinson's disease, resulting in improved posture, decreased tremor, and improved balance and walking. The group class format also has proven benefits. Working out as a team enhances self-efficacy, increases long-term participation, and may help to alleviate the non-motor symptoms of the disease, such as fatigue, stress, apathy, and anxiety. I joke, but I'm not really joking, that I only did one thing right when I started the Center for Parkinson's Disease almost six years ago. I partnered with skilled, dedicated, incredible coaches. Seth Greiner and Brianna Arnold lead our Hampton Bays program, and Michelle Delgiorno, who is a finalist for Rocksteady Boxing Coach of the Year internationally last year, runs the program here in Sag Harbor. Together, our coaches have grown the program from five boxers in September 2017 to almost 250 boxers today. They have led 2,500 Rocksteady Boxing classes, resulting in more than 22,000 class visits. Six months after launching the Center for Parkinson's Disease in the spring of 2018, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. The diagnosis was crushing to me. I couldn't get out of bed. I stopped eating. I didn't work. My husband, Nile, finally said to me, how can you ask your boxers to get up every day and fight if you're not willing to do so yourself? And so I did get out of bed, and I also chose to fight. A diagnosis of any illness comes with silver linings, which in my case were many. I've become deeply rooted in this community in which I live and work. Many in the Parkinson's community delivered food, offered to care for my girls, buy groceries, share grief. And perhaps more importantly, it has provided me a compassion that no book or research article can teach. The current exhibit here at the church, Strike Fast, Dance Lightly, Artists Unboxing, is, as Eric Fischel, co-founder and co-president of the church, wrote, a sermon about the belief and value we put on the struggle to be, to live, to understand, to love, to try, and to never give up. I cannot imagine a group of individuals or a team of fighters who embody this sentiment more than our rock-steady boxers. It is with great humility and honor that I hand this program over to our head coach, Michelle Del Giorno, and her team of rock-steady boxing fighters. Michelle, the stage is yours. So we're going to introduce our fighters. 
first part of the flow drill three times. The combo one, two, three, two. Go.
Microphones. Yeah. And um, it, is Don't be there? Shy. Wait, he's really shy. <laughs> do we do we have a first question from the audience? Okay, um, Sherry's going to get you the. Oh, I just wanted to mention that um, I'm a five-year uh, 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 person at a uh, fighter at uh, Roxton. Boxing veteran, and uh, it's not just as you were saying. It's not just your body; it's your mind. You have to remember a lot of stuff, and you have to uh, answer some uh, quick mathematics tests too when you're doing the bike boxing. Sometimes I'll let Sarah talk about that. Thank you. <laughs> I think you said it beautifully. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but just to touch upon that, it's true. Oh, I will leave my business cards on the table right by the door as you leave back there, and then he can just reach out to me. Um, 
I do have a website. So if you Google Center for Parkinson's Disease, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, it'll take you to my website. Um, it has my phone number there, as well as information about all the programs that we offer. Yeah. Is your friend here on the east end? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right Great. And he rows his boat every day. Very nice. Maybe that's our next program. <laughs> So you can also go to rocksteadyboxing.org. They have over about 900 affiliates worldwide, so you can find a location if you know someone that you know, doesn't necessarily live here, and you'd like to tell them about Rocksteady Boxing. So it is uh, global now. They do have a lot of locations. So thank you, Michelle and Sarah, for this amazing display of hard work in the community and putting exercise in action. Um, you, some of you know me as a physical therapist and friend and colleague of Sarah's, and I'm super excited to see her work and partnership with Michelle in action. But who I'd really like to hear from are some of the boxers who um, have obviously displayed their physical prowess, and I, we know how beneficial that is, but I'd like to hear from them about how um, the program has benefited you in other ways, either cognitively or socially or emotionally, and um, maybe you can give us some examples of how that program has helped you. Well, for me, it gets me out of the house. <laughs> and um, it helps me. I feel that I've, you know, am able to move a lot more. That the disease itself is not getting me down. It's also, it's, it's fostered a sense of community for me. Um, it, I, I have, a, I have a, a peer group that I never anticipated having. Uh, it's, 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 it's enjoyable to be able to chat up somebody about medication. Um, and and, and movement, movement disorder therapists and, and such. Um, there's a real esprit de corps in the class. And uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's really quite lovely. I'm a very lazy person. <laughs> I haven't done a, a, a consecutive exercise class since I finished at drama school in 1972. <laughs> this has been so energizing and attractive to me is the, the, the camaraderie that my friend was talking about is a, is a real thing. And I'm getting a little emotional, so I think I better quit right now. I believe that it helps me in every possible way, cognitively, socially. I, I enjoy going to the classes in person so much. I, just the camaraderie is wonderful. And I feel that it's keeping me strong. I mean, whatever doctor I see or whatever people I see that I haven't seen in a while, they, they can't believe that I have Parkinson's for over 12 years. That I know of. I, you know, I probably had it even before that. So it's, it's everything for me. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if I was imagining it or projecting it, but it seemed like within the short exercise regime you just did, I watched the participants become more coordinated, more agile, more, you know, there, it, was I imagining that, or hoping for it, or what, was, it, was it actually there? Yes, we were all actually rather gifted athletes, naturally. <laughs> You're, you're imagining that completely. <laughs> and we're all starting out on the pro Parkinson's uh, circuit <laughs> next week. Hi, I just, um, thank you for this, and thank you for this, and I just want to comment, I, I love Sarah and Michelle both so much, um, I just want to comment on your incredible ability and, and consistency, Michelle, and how you find ways to continually connect the community in all the myriad of ways you do through this program, through your business, 
there, like the way you give, people don't even know. I want to write a book about it sometime and just so you're getting the accolades you, clearly many people feel this way, but I just, your, your way of connecting community and then further, I feel like now I'm part of your community now too and thank you for that education and that sharing um, and just doing all you can to connect us because I know how hard it can be and lonely and <laughs> internal and so thank you for spreading it out and sharing it with us it's really great thank you so much. well i started with rock study before pandemic before covid and then i was very delighted that you were able to bring it to the zoom classes and now I hear reference to in-person classes again, and I'm not just sure how to find them. We will connect, Diane. <laughs> we will talk. <laughs> Any other questions on this side of the room? I see Finney. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, how long does it take for somebody with Parkinson's to start seeing improvement if they're participating in one of these programs? That is a great question. I can answer it anecdotally, um, although it is in the research also. So as a physical therapist, I would generally work with people two to three times a week for six to eight weeks. And in that period of time, we often saw quite substantial improvements with many of my patients now scoring at sort of in normal ranges on many of the outcome measures I used. Um, the trick, and I think this is true for all of us, not just for people with living with Parkinson's disease, is that you then need to continue doing it. Um, so that's the important piece. And if I could just add that, you know, the class, the camaraderie, it really lifts everyone's spirits. So that really adds to their general well-being as well. Um, you know, that they just feel very positive and we obviously have a lot of laughs. <laughs> I can't say which is the most important uh, segment or part of this program, but um, I, uh, three years ago I was able to move my arms when I was swimming, but not my legs at the same time. I couldn't do the flutter kick. Uh, I, I now I'm able to do that. And I, I, I think it has to do with Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Um, I just want to say I find you all so profoundly impressive. And this has been really moving to watch. Um, going back to some of the slides that you showed at the very beginning, Sarah, I want, I'm just wondering if um, there's any chance of getting this program in front of government officials, Congress, the E, I'll expletive deleted, PA. <laughs> I mean, there, there should not be the, the environmental challenges that we're facing given all the other apocalyptic things going on unaddressed that are affecting so many people and an increasing amount of people globally. And have, has there been any thought to try to bring this before Congress, before government? Yeah, so the doctors that I referenced in my lecture who wrote this book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, this is pretty much what they have dedicated their careers to now. Um, they have a website, I believe it's, if you Google ending Parkinson's disease, it, you'll definitely find it. Um, sign up for their newsletter and you know email list. They are regularly sending out updated information. They had a letter campaign last year where they were asking people to mail letters to Congress specifically about these issues, and the idea was to flood Congress with, I can't remember the exact number, but hundreds of thousands of letters all at the same time so that they couldn't ignore it. Um, so I think we are at a tipping point. I think it's going to change. Um, you know, as the awareness of the disease increases, it's getting harder and harder to not have these conversations. Um, and more and more grassroots organizations are coming together and you know, saying enough is enough. It's time to have these conversations, yeah. And is there any corollary between Parkinson's and Alzheimer, like in terms of myelin sheath deterioration and all those things that also MS people suffer? I just am wondering if there are any connections that can be drawn because so many people seem to be more acutely aware of Alzheimer's yeah. 
Uh, maybe that's just my perception, but um, this is so profoundly important. Yeah, that's a great question, and I'll answer it in two ways. One is I do believe more people are aware of Alzheimer's disease because there are more people living with the disease. Um, however, I also think that is going to change because Parkinson's now is being diagnosed at a much faster rate than Alzheimer's. Um, so I, I think awareness of Parkinson's disease likewise will increase and um, the understanding of disease cause and disease treatment will also become, uh, I think, more front and center. Um, in terms of similarities, I, I'm gonna defer on that question because I'll probably say something wrong and then be embarrassed later. Um, there are some similarities in terms of protein development in the brain at a cellular level, but the proteins are different. Um, so I'll leave it at that and, um, and yeah, leave it at that for now. But thank you for the question, it's a good question. Thank you, and I just, I think that everyone that's participating in this program is so, as I said, inspiring. And I hope that people of all stripes and of all, you know, whatever is affecting you, exercise is important all the time in your whole life. And this is just like uh, amazing proof of it on a whole other level. So I couldn't agree with so you much. more. Thank you so much. Along those lines, I am Thomas's mom. <laughs> And I have to tell you that you all are heroes in our household. If it's the end of the day and Thomas says, hey, did you exercise today? And I say, oh no, you know, I had this, I had that. And he looks straight on at me and says, my rock steady boxers have no excuses. <laughs> so thank you for that, thank you. Do you have another one over there, Sara? Do we have any, any questions over I, here? I have a you question. Have one. Go for it, yeah. Um, I would like to ask the lady boxers, um, you know, as a gender, perhaps it is not so expected to box. What, what did it actually feel like to take up the gloves and start the training? Powerful. <laughs> Powerful, yeah. It just feels natural. You know, I, I can't discern the, the difference between male and female when it comes to boxing. It just feels natural and I go at it if I, were, if I were male or female, just go at it to get, to get stronger. Um, many times where we've split the class in two, into two line drills, you know, we do a lot of those line drills and we do the guys on one side, girls on the other, like we've had a pretty even split mostly, I'd say. Yeah, yeah it's great to see, yeah. The women are not shy, <laughs> that's for sure. Hi, um, I also join the community of people who bow down to you yes. and are inspired by you. Thank you so much for this today. I've learned so much. Um, my, my question is, the Rock Steady program and, and Sarah, your work, is it exclusive just to Parkinson's or are there other neurodegenerative diseases that would come under this umbrella who could also participate? What a great question. Uh, the Rock Steady Boxing program is designed specifically for people with Park Parkinson's disease and in fact we're really not even supposed to allow care partners or friends or loved ones to join the class. Um, that comes from the national program itself and the way they've created it. And I think they have their reasons for that. Um, the, and I'll, let, I'll hand it over to Michelle to speak about why Rock Steady is specific to Parkinson's disease. Um, as it relates to my programs, I also limit it to Parkinson's disease, and it is not because other neurodegenerative disorders wouldn't benefit from it, and I am aware of that, and it is a sort of a space of uh, perhaps regret on my part. Um, but my funding, which comes from private donors in the community, have earmarked their money specific to Parkinson's disease. Um, so I honor that and honor their reasons for doing that. Um, and I will also say there are real benefits, I think, about exercising and being together in group programs with a shared experience. Um, and I think that's important for our participants and for me as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say that uh, the Rocksteady Boxing Method is, you know, 
is just is for Parkinson specific, but uh, I do train people privately, elder community of uh, people with other movement disorders, and I do use a lot of the same. Again, because if we're boxing, you know, it's all the things that we need to work on, you know, which is you know our balance and movement, agility, um, that fighting spirit, and all that. So it really kind of does cross over. But for rock steady boxing, it is just a Parkinson's program. Thank you. And I will add, the hospital is going to build a new hospital at some point, and just planting a seed, center of neuro... <laughs> we can expand. <laughs> we have a question over here. Hi. Um, as a partner of somebody in your program, I cannot thank you enough and speak high enough about this program. Um, but I had a question also. Um, you mentioned that over 200 people have gone through your program. To your knowledge, is there a higher concentration of Parkinson's on the east end of Long Island? It's a great question for which I don't have a great answer, unfortunately. I have looked for that information and it's very difficult to come by um, for many different reasons. When I wrote the proposal for the Center for Parkinson's Disease, I used national estimates to estimate how many people I would be able to reach and serve with these programs, and that number was about 220 people on the East End. Um, so the fact that we have over 250 boxers who've come through our doors and accessed at least one of our programs tells me, one, the program is you know, well received in the community, but two, that our numbers are probably, my estimates were low to begin with. Um, so that's, that's a great question and, and one that I would like to be able to answer better at some point in the future. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wondered that if there are uh, reasons you mentioned why, uh, I mean, about certain findings medically that uh, are associated with Parkinson's, but, and I have always been, along with many people here, I'm sure, very interested in why, for instance, uh, you know, pesticides to the, that have been uh, determined to be cancer-causing or Parkinson's. Uh, my, I guess my question is, uh, what about the whole controversy of that? And with the, the because I was I was a landscaper for my profession, and they they continue to have the same cancer-causing, uh, you know products for sale after after a lot of uh, court cases. And I don't want to go on and on, but I wondered if there was any uh, thought about that and that, that people could do, and it, if you think it's appropriate. Thank you. I really appreciate that question, Stan. And I have to be honest, when I talk about Parkinson's disease and I've you know, given a number of different interviews and lectures and presentations, I've never been as explicit as I was today. And I'll tell you why. I was afraid. I was afraid, what if I say something wrong? What if the research isn't as good as I think it is? Um, I, I really never have taken that leap before. And the reason I did it today truly is, I believe, because of the bravery and dedication of these neurologists who are now coming out. They've published the book. I highly recommend anyone in this room to read it, Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescription to Action. Um, they are on the lecture circuit. They are speaking online. They're speaking in person. Um, there was an article in The Guardian recently that came out specifically about Paraquat and exactly this, the fact that they've known, I think it was from the 80s, the effects of Paraquat on human beings and talking about the cover-up and you know these doctors are talking about this the same way we talked about smoking and other public health concerns that were ignored or even worse sort of hidden for a long period of time. Uh, I am hopeful because of them giving people like me and people like you and people in this room a voice uh, that that voice will get louder and louder to a point where it's just not possible to ignore it anymore. Is there's probably time for one more question? Here. Thank you. Thank you. 
you, Sarah. I would be remiss if I didn't say something to you. Um, all I can say is, you know, we've had this long history together. My father was perhaps your first Parkinson's patient, and, you know, I've watched you grow this program. I've watched you grow your family. My, now my daughter is volunteering at Rocksteady on Fridays. My heart is so full today. It's, it's, it's been emotional for me. But all I can say is you are um, a rock star. <laughs> and thank you. You just are. <laughs> and thank you. I love you. I love you. Um, I'm bursting with pride for you today. And Michelle, and you know, how soon is it, having had a parent with Parkinson's, you know, what can I do to pre prevent this for myself? How soon can I start classes? <laughs> Should eight. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liza. It's very important for me that you're all here. I couldn't do any of this without, without all of you and um, this incredible community. So the feelings are mutual. I'm grateful. Thank you. One, one last question over here. here. Thanks for making that exception. I, I, on the subject of esprit de corps and fraternity, and, uh, those of us who've been in Michelle's classes, I don't know about the other classes, uh, always wrap it up with a cheesy cheer from Gordon. And I just wondered, how's Gordon doing? What's going on? Gordon sent an email sending his regards. He is here in spirit. So I will let him know that you asked about him. Thank you, Diane. We're all wishing yeah. you well. Yeah, and of course, you know, the chair that I, the cheesy chair I, I read today, I ran it past Gordon first for his approval. So just to provide a little bit of context, one of our boxers writes all of the cheesy chairs, and he has 400 cheesy chairs at this point, categorized by season, uh, weather, holidays, holidays birthdays. yeah, birthdays. So we're, we're looking to publish it next year if anyone's a publisher. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, it's wonderful.